series of Dr. X's sessions, we have with us Dr. A.K. Singh, who is a renowned diabetologist and endocrinologist at GD Hospital and Diabetes Institute, Kolkata. He is also the speaker and chairman of the Association of Physicians of India. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for being with us. Also, we have Dr. Mohan Tichanoy with us, who is a consultant endocrinologist at Sri Gokula Medical College, Duvendra. Thank you, Dr. Shanoy, for being with us. So today, we will be discussing about the treatment of type 2 diabetes from older to newer treatment perspectives. Shall we start? Yeah. So Dr. Singh, beginning with this uh, treatment of type 2 diabetes, I would like to know what were the older perspectives that we used for treating them? Well, uh, so of course, when it comes to the treating type 2 diabetes, uh, the story goes back to sulfonylurea. We are using since 1950. That is the oldest drug to be used, uh, you know, in the treatment of type 2 diabetes, and then uh, followed by immediately followed by metformin, and then since then uh, we have got many uh, newer drugs in between. Uh, Pyolitazone, rosiglitazone came. Rosiglitazone had to be withdrawn because of alleged cardiovascular issues, uh, and then we are in the era of DPP4 inhibitor now and the GLT2 and GLP1 agonist. If you are not including insulin right now into the picture. Right, so that was the older era. What about the newer drugs that are coming up? Can you enlighten us, Dr. Shanoff? Yeah, so the newer diabetic uh, drugs actually have taken into account the obesity factor also. Because obesity is one factor which we can prevent diabetes also. So now we are making it weight neutral and weight free or reducing the weight also. And cardiovascular mortality also is important. So the newer drugs have included the weight perspective, the cardiovascular perspective, as well as the patient's convenience. And new, newer oral diabetic drugs are like that. Mm -hmm. So I would like to allude to the GLP-1 agonist. Yes. That is the glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide. Mm -hmm. These are the gut-derived peptide because we know stomach as an organ itself can produce a lot of signals. Exactly. And appetite signals can control and the obesity also. Right. So the hypothalamic center is stimulated and appetite is suppressed. So that way we can reduce weight and they have got reduced from HbA1c that is the marker for diabetic control mm -hmm. and finally we have got cardiovascular risk reduction. Okay. So GLP-1 agonists are like oral, recently they are going to develop and now they are developed as an injection form, subcutaneous form and there are a variety of GLP-1 agonists available in the market and of course there are many things to choose from. So the diabetic uh, doctor who treats the patient definitely needs to be aware of all these options available as a newer drugs. So Dr. Singh, do you agree to that? Would you like to add something about the GLP-A1 agonists? So it's, it's a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So the GLP-1 is a glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist. Uh, these are, uh, you know, kind of uh, medications which has been designed in a fashion that uh, these molecules per se will not cause hypoglycemia. As Mohan said, uh, this is a glucose dependent blood glucose lowering drug. So if you inject by mistakenly to someone who is mm -hmm. non-diabetic, there will be no change in the blood sugar to someone who is non-diabetic. So naturally, mm -hmm. uh, if you use it in a type 2 diabetic patient, it will reduce the blood sugar but will not cause hypoglycemia uh, alone. Uh, the, apart from the blood glucose control, we, this uh, these you know class of drug has a potential to reduce body weight significantly, they reduces blood pressure significantly and you know collecting together the drug which can reduce blood pressure weight and blood glucose has a potential to reduce cardiovascular event and we do have now cardiovascular outcome trials which has happened with GLP-1 agonist which suggested that if you use this drug, this drug has a potential to reduce the cardiovascular death or other cardiovascular burden. So nowadays if you see the current ADASD guideline, they do recommend if you have got a diabetic patients with established heart disease, you should use either a GLP-1 agonist or a CLT-2 inhibitor. That's the beauty of this newer class of drug. Right. So that's the beauty, like you said, of the new classification of drugs. What about sulfonylureas? What is the benefit of sulfonylurea over the GLP? Well, so sulfonylurea is, you know, uh, the beauty with sulfonylurea is it's a time-tested drug. GLP-1 uh, is, is hardly a 10-year-old molecule uh, and uh, sulfonylurea is, is, is 50 years old. Uh, it's very cheap. Everyone can afford. The blood glucose reduction with sulfonylurea is very robust. So if you see any head-to-head -head trial of sulfonylurea, uh, you know, already done with uh, other active comparator like DPP-4 or a CLT-2, in initial three months, you see the sulfonylurea is, is giving you a much more kick, means lowering blood glucose even better than these newer drugs. But then down the line, 
if you continue the trial for a little longer period of time, the initial blood sugar drop, which is very quick with sulfonylurea, seems to disappear after some time. Although in the recent head-to-head -head trial of Carolina, where sulfonylurea glimepiride was compared to linagliptin up to 6.2 years, blood glucose you know, control was similar between sulfonylurea glimepiride and linagliptin. So earlier, which was it was thought that this drug has a potential to lose control over the time, uh, which perhaps is not the case. So the beauty with SUG is this is a time-tested drug. It doesn't have any side effect except it causes hypoglycemia. Yes, there is little weight gain with the older sulfonylurea. If you talk about glyclazide, uh, hardly it caused any weight gain in the advanced, you know, advanced trial. So we have newer sulfonylurea like glimepiride or glyclazide, which doesn't seem to have uh, too much of weight gain. Glyclazide in particular uh, has a potential to cause least hypoglycemia in the class. So yes, we have got a mix and match of both older and newer drug. We need everything. You know, uh, without sulfonylurea, perhaps we can't treat diabetes. We need every all the drugs because they all are working in a different fashion. Diabetes is a multifactorial disease right. and we need to treat all the factors together. Right, Dr. Singh. So, Dr. Shanai, would you also agree to that, that uh, like he said, that it's a time-tested drug. So, yeah. would you believe in yeah. so, all this goal? Yeah, so that is true. But because the problem is that patient knows about a new drug which has come in. Mm -hmm. So, I, at this juncture, I would like to tell about the islet-based fulcrum theory, which was actually by a consensus document which published recently on GLP-1 agonist. They had a multi-center South Asian population studied. In that, it was mentioned that the beta cell fatigue, as sir alluded to, that on the long run, there is a, a problem that a sulfonylurea can cause wear and tear and the fatigue can be there in the beta cell. Mm -hmm. So that factor, that beta cell fatigue is addressed there. Also, alpha cell overactivity. Because you know, beta cell from pancreas, there is mm -hmm. alpha cell component, right. glucagon component. So alpha cell component has also been addressed properly. Mm -hmm. So now that study has, uh, has proven that the options available now are going to be increased. Mm -hmm. So now we are hearing that long-acting GLP-1 agonists are also there. Mm -hmm. That once mm -hmm. weekly. So would you prefer a once weekly drug to a daily drug, twice daily, twice daily? That's one thing which patient there. And affordability, we should not mistake a patient. So mm -hmm. we, we cannot tell that how far they can afford or not. Unless we truly know their background, how they are. Right. So we don't know one person businessman comes. Maybe he's not earning that much. Mm -hmm. But person the farmer or area, maybe he'll earn more. So we cannot just by a looks or something, we cannot estimate their affordability. Exactly. But definitely they are a bit expensive at present. Mm -hmm. But now oral drugs are going to be tested. So I think pleiotropic effect of GLP-1 is not, no doubt it's a very important thing to be considered. So uh, is the choice of drug? Yeah, is it's it the, choice the choice of the of physician drug? and the choice of the patient. Basically it comes down to the compliance also. So even if you drug, whatever you choose and whatever you drug, after three months they choose another doctor <laughs> or choose another doctor. Right. They are also important. But definitely we have to show the evidence how much HbA1c has reduced. Hmm. Of course, I agree that it's insulin-like action. So a sulfonylurea can produce HbA1c of 1.5 to 3. Hmm. But definitely now the drugs are coming there. We can have a good reduction of cardiovascular risk also by this GLP-1 agonist. So Dr. Singh, in what circumstances should one avoid sulfonylureas? Well, so... Uh, see, as I said, the only issue with sulfonylurea is it causes hypoglycemia because reduction in blood glucose uh, with sulfonylurea is glucose independent. So, as I, I said earlier, uh, if I am not diabetic, I have consumed sulfonylurea, I will right now develop hypoglycemia. Whereas if I take GLP-1, nothing will happen to me. Mm -hmm. So, that's the difference between sulfonylurea and GLP-1 agonist or DPP-4 inhibitor or a GLT-2. They do not per se cause hypoglycemia unlike sulfonylurea. So, that's the one issue with sulfonylurea. So someone who is prone to develop hypoglycemia, like elderly people, someone having a chronic kidney disease who tends to develop hypoglycemia faster, someone with uh, other comorbidities where possibilities of hypoglycemia are higher, uh, these are the groups of people where perhaps you would like to avoid sulfonylurea. Right. Means uh, these are not contraindicated. You can reduce the dose and give it the modern SUs like glyclazide uh, is causing hypoglycemia at, at par with the DPP-4 inhibitor. We do have a randomized controlled trial during Ramadan during fasting and uh, glyclazide was as good as a DPP-4 inhibitor in terms of causing hypoglycemia. So little bit hype was created with uh, hypoglycemia with sulfonylurea, but then truly hypoglycemia issue remains with sulfonylurea with the older drug. Mm -hmm. The glibenclamide was the drug which was been infected with hypoglycemia issues. Even glipizide caused much more hypoglycemia, but glipizide caused much lesser hypoglycemia compared to the previous one. And glyclazide MR uh, caused even lesser hypoglycemia than glipizide. We do have head-to-head -head trial 
between glycolazide and MR with the glipiparide and 50% less hypoglycemia with the glycolazide was seen. So it's not necessary that you should club sulfonylurea as a class together. There are differences in properties among the sulfonylurea in the classes. Exactly. I would like to add that sure. an antioxidant properties also described to the glycolazide molecule. They are mentioning that some chain. Mm -hmm. that right. These are all theoretical yeah. issues, but then yeah, yeah in terms of uh, as you asked whether it should be avoided in some certain yes. subgroups of patients. So someone who are prone to develop hypoglycemia okay. should avoid sulfonylurea. Okay. One question that I would like to ask you both. How can we personalize the treatment for diabetic patients? Let's say, uh, like you mentioned, that GLP is a bit expensive. So without using high technology expensive products or equipments, how can we usually personalize the treatment for diabetes? Uh, One thing would be to document the glucose values mm -hmm. because now we have gone from the sugar centric to glucose centric because we know that glucose is one molecule which has got multiple areas where they go in biochemically. Right. So we should document that glucose readings in a notebook or text which is the simplest thing. Mm -hmm. Either you do a document of glucose values done by your finger prick method, you take a diary and write it down. Then, then write the medicines what you are carrying and put a co cover on front of it that you mm -hmm. are a diabetic and anywhere you go you have to carry these medicines with you. Exactly. That's the most simple thing. Mm -hmm. Whichever drug you use, finally the use of <coughs> compliance only. And next thing, what, whatever you are using the drugs, don't stop a drug without giving it a trial. Mm -hmm. So maybe a GLP-1 can be used for three months, six months, but after a point like SU, they also have that period where that they just lack to act that right. same way. Mm -hmm. So definitely they need to see the doctor again and document the way they comply with it. Finally, the, the doctor and the uh, patient should sit together and mm -hmm. speak. So diabetic distress is another problem because patient get social issues because sometimes they stop the medicine, then they come back, intensify treatment. So what happens is that they lose the control up, up and down. Mm -hmm. So that way, compliance will improve, the stress will also reduce and finally results will also improve. Right. So with regard to your question, how to select different drugs in a diabetic patients. Now it's very easy. Mm -hmm. With the avail available evidence which we have now, uh, it's very clear cut, uh, you know, recommendations from the trial which has happened in uh, past 12 years now since 2008. If someone comes to you with diabetes and he has a history of established heart disease or has a history of heart failure and has evidence of chronic diabetic kidney disease, the two drugs should be preferably used is a GLP-1 agonist or a GLT-2 inhibitor. Okay. If the patient doesn't have established heart disease or heart failure or kidney disease, then you can use any drug including sulfonylurea. I am talking after the metformin. Right. So we are talking choosing second line drug after metformin. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask me that if someone has got established heart disease and can't afford uh, newer drugs like GLP-1 agonist and SGLT-2, can we use sulfonylurea? Yes, we can use. We can use sulfonylurea even in a patient who had established heart disease because that's what the trial we have. The Carolina trial was done in a patient with established uh, heart disease. Not everyone, 50% patient in the Carolina had established heart disease and the glimiparide was found to be exactly equal to the linagliptin in terms of cardiovascular risk. Mm -hmm. So now we do have evidence that modern sulfonylurea like glimiparide and glycolazide uh, doesn't do any cardiac damage. So if someone who can't afford uh, the costlier drug like GLP-1 as also it is injectable yes. or a GLT-2, although it's oral drug, but it's costly, you can use even sulfonylurea, especially the glimiparide and glycolazide if someone has even got established cardiovascular disease. That's great to know. That was great information, Dr. Singh and Dr. Shinoy. Lastly, I would like to know what key message would you like to share with our Doctrixis community? One by one, please. So, uh, well, uh, See, over the uh, past two decades, the life has become easier for all of us now. Uh, you know, 10 years back or even five years back, we were not clear in terms of what to start with. We had a number of, uh, you know, drugs available, but it was difficult to decide which one to start, which patient actually need which one. Now, after these, uh, you know, cardiovascular outcome trials, now we have a absolute clarity with regards to uh, choosing a drug. So, as I said, uh, the life has now easier. Uh, after these trials, clearly data suggests that if your patient can't afford, if his patient is diabetic and not having established kidney disease or heart disease, you can use any drug after metformin, including sulfonylurea. If your patient is uh, is known established heart disease and patient can afford, from the available data, it suggests that both GLP-1 agonist and SGLT-2 inhibitor had shown a remarkable benefit in the CB outcome, GLT-2 especially in the kidney outcome as well. So if someone has got a kidney disease, I would prefer a GLT-2 provided you can use it. There is no contraindication to use a GLT-2. 
uh, for example, up to EGFR 45 and GLP-1 agonist if someone has got established heart disease. If you have got a heart failure, SGLT-2 is the first choice, GLP-1 is the second line drug uh, in the patients with established heart failure. If you don't have anything, you can use any drug after <laughs> metformin. That was a very informative key message. What about you, Dr. Shinar? Doc says I have been associated the last four years. I have been observing that they are coming out with a lot of new ways to interact. And this is one platform where I see that uh, I am a young person, so is a, a very <laughs> senior doctor. I get feel free to discuss such topics in an open forum. And uh, these meetings like this are real good ventures because uh, knowledge sharing platforms right. in our country, which is a load of a diabetic population, we want to make it a diabetic care population. Mm -hmm. We don't want the patients to come back with morbidity and mortality. Exactly. We want them to improve. We don't want any patient to come back with all these complications. So being a doctor's person who is a member, active member, I feel these things of uh, dialogues are one way by which doctors get to know each other and improve our lives also. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanan. That is actually what we are trying to do. We are trying to empower doctors by this. So thank you so much, Dr. Singh and Dr. Shanan for you, the time. Thank you, sir. It was really a great discussion and it was great to know the treatment perspective from older to the newer. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. You.